And um, try to let me know if, if the audio drops out for some reason too. I've been having um, some, some Wi-Fi dropouts occasionally this week. So if you will suddenly lose audio or, or I'm not being heard, um, try to attract my attention. I have another monitor watching the chat if it's, if it's anything, all right? So good morning again, everyone. Welcome to our class today. So what we're doing is continuing our discussion on the infinite response filters that we started early on this week, right? If you would remember um, what we did on Monday is that there were two ways that, that we can design the infinite response filters. One, which is what we spent the time on Monday looking at was to match the time response. And if you recall the other way, this is really transfer function, function um, matching, right? And the transfer function, uh, again, uh, from from what we know and have been doing, uh, you know, throughout the, the the program, the transfer function of any system is simply the Laplace transform of the impulse response of the system. So, if I what, what I'm trying to do is to take the transfer function in the analog domain from a prototype that I know is behaving well, and by using this mapping, that I make a transfer function in the digital domain where the impulse response is exactly the same or close to it. And by doing that, the frequency response is supposed to match. Um, there are differences as we saw. Um, one of the big differences of course, is that the phase goes all over the place. So you do not use these filters at all, um, right? Not to be used, right? If phase, is important, right? So do not use um, the infinite response filters if phase is important for you. You have to use the finite response filters, which were the symmetrical filter designs that we looked at last time. So time response or transfer function mapping is what we looked at on Monday. Today, we are going to look at the other way of, of making these infinite response filters, which is to match the frequency response. And we do that by a, a, a little something on a transform, right? This is not a transform in the, to the extent that we understand it, like a Laplace or a Fourier or a Z. This is really a mapping, right? Again, is a mapping, right? So, Let's see how that works. When we compared um, the Z transform to the Laplace, you realize that 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 if we that that we could make the two transforms agree if we substitute the Z in the Z transform for e to the s capital T, where of course capital T is the sampling period, or T is equal to one over F s, your sampling frequency. So if you do that, then you can get, and then of course solve for S from that little equation up there, you get S is equal to the natural log of Z over T. But that by itself is a little bit of a problem. If I were to give you something like um, H S is equal to one over S plus one, just as simple as that is. If I try to substitute that for Z, I'm going to have a log, a natural log Z here over T, Right? How do I get this now in the form of HZ? So all of the relationship mathematically is working. The practicality of doing it is, 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 is really very small. Okay? So this is difficult to substitute. So what we do instead is that we use a first order approximation for this exponential function. And we do that as a power series. And if you recall sometime way back when, probably in Cape and so on, you'd have come across some series called Taylor and McLaurin series, right? We're not going to do it here. And you probably was wondering, well, when, 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 when you were doing that in, in, in high school, where on earth am I ever going to meet this again? Well, here you are, 
third year, third year engineering and, and, and it's coming to bite you again, right? So what you do and you don't have to learn, you don't have to learn the, the, the McLaurin expansion, but if you were to go back and dig up in your notes somewhere, you would see that e to the STS, I can, if I, first off, I can express this as, as in this form, e to the STS over two, over e to the minus STS over two. And then expand each of these in a power series, just to the first approximation. Remember the, ta the, the Taylor would then have the, the next derivative over um, um, three factorial, and then the next derivative over four factorial and so on. And the same thing underneath here, right? We're not going to, 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 to look at that. What we're doing is stopping at the first order. So it is an approximation. So e to the s t s is one plus s t s over two over one minus s t s over two, and that is approximately equal to z, right? We said z is equal z is equal to this, and then if we make an approximation, but we we ignore the higher order derivatives in the Maclaurin series, right? So it's it, it's going from exactly equal to approximately. I'm going to, to, to tune it down a little bit and see where, if we could um, get it a little more accurate, all right? So if you do that, then I can solve for Z in terms of S. And notice now I have a nice little relationship between S and Z. Still an approximation sign here. So what we do is that we say, we generalize this and we let S equal to some constant C z minus one over z plus one. The constant, of course, takes into the account whatever is required to make this go from, from an approximation to a full equal, okay? So we're already following so far, right? We take the expansion for e to the sts, we break it up into, in, into um, a numerator and a denominator, and then we expand each once, the first order McLaurin expansion, and then simplify. Notice that this, and you'll see this in another slide, I can also express this as C1 minus Z to the minus one over one plus Z to the power minus one, right? Which is the sort of version we prefer in, in, in signal processing and in engineering but this one is easier to manipulate for algebra, right? If you're making the substitution, it's easier to do it this way, okay? But we eventually have to get the answer looking um, back within the negative indices. This is called the bilinear transform, okay? So it's not, it's a mapping. And what you're doing is that you have something in the S domain, this is the S plane, and then you have the Z plane. And we're taking things from here and mapping them into something here and using that relationship between S and Z called the bilinear transform. Okay, so it's basically translating. It's like a translation then from a point in one plane to a point in the other, okay? So let's see how that helps us. What we're trying to do is this. We're matching the frequency response. So we're going to take an analog filter. We start off with some analog filter, right? And the response does this. So this is HS here. And I want to design an, an, a, a discrete filter here. This is HZ, and this is the response of the discrete filter here. And what I want, the idea behind the bilinear transform is that I'm going to take some frequency here. We we'll talk about what is on the slide in a second. I'm going to take some frequency here, F, and the response is at this point, A, and here now is the filter, sorry, I'll call this FA. Here is the 
digital filter that I want to design, and they, they, they at some frequency F now, where the amplitude is A, right? This is what I want. So I want to take my analog, some, some response in my analog filter, and the frequency that I want in my digital filter, I want that the response here to be equal, right? So what I'm assuming is that if the response, if I pick a frequency here in the, in the analog domain and the frequency gives me some magnitude A, in the discrete domain at some frequency F, which is a whatever is that filter um, frequency that I want, if that magnitude is also A, then because of the bilinear transform, this response is going to match that response, right? That is the idea behind the, the, the frequency matching response. And notice what we're doing again. So we're taking the analog filter. Of course, the, 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 the response is some, and because we, we, we deal with complex numbers, the, the response is really running from minus FA, right? If you like, it's, it's going from minus FA to FA. And the digital frequency range, remember the highest frequency we can have in the discrete range is FS over two to avoid aliasing and Nyquist, uh, and to satisfy the Nyquist criteria. So in other words, whatever is the analog frequency range here, we have to map it to a maximum of plus or minus FS over two to avoid aliasing. Everybody okay with that? Yeah? Let me know. Makes sense, right? There's something that we've been sort of drumming over um, and over a period of time. Good, thanks. So the objective is to map FA. This is what we know. Right? This is what we know. Known into this range, which is plus or minus F, well, Fs over two. And if we do it properly, then we map, we basically map the analog filter into some discrete filter design. Okay? We saw this already. So, so we have two versions of this. And what we want, what we want therefore is that HZ, you take whatever HS is, you substitute S equal to this. into it, and then you get the transfer function of the filter that you're trying to design. So we're going to see how that works, right? We have some things, we have to first of all figure out what C is. So as I said, how this works is that at some analog frequency A, the response of HS has to map onto some frequency for the digital filter. Right, which is this here. So at some analog frequency FA, that amplitude, that magnitude has to map onto the, the, the this is my discrete filter here, has to map onto the filter, the, the frequency into the digital domain. And if it maps because of the shape and the, 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 the how the transform is supposed to work, the entire response is supposed to follow as well. Right? So in other words, HZ at some frequency F is supposed to be exactly equal to HS at some frequency F subscript A. All right? Let's see what they, how, how to get now. We have to still figure out what on earth C is, how to calculate that. So we go back here. First off, at FA, so let's say I have, I have some filter S plus um, 2. For argument C, right? So H S is equal to that S plus two, right? We know H J omega will be one over J omega plus two, right? So if I want at some frequency F A H at J omega A, we substitute S equal to J omega, and of course, we know omega is 2 pi Fe, 
Okay, we know this, right? We're starting off knowing that. Let's go on the other side now. Z is equal to e to the s t s, which is where the bilinear transform start started, which is h. You remember, um, s is two pi f. So therefore, if I make the substitution, remember I have c into z minus one over z plus one, right? Z is e to the j two pi f over t s. This is the unknown here, right? For the time being, this is what we want. This is where we want the, the, the response system match, all right? So the response at f a is supposed to match the response at f. So we make the substitutions here and we solve now for C. I solve for C, rearrange and simplify. I get that FA is C over two pi. This actually, just like we did with the Euler's expressions that we have before, I can express this in terms of tan, right? So C over two pi tan pi, FTS or C over two pi tan pi F over FS. This one is easy to remember. So you have everything inside of here. I know this because this is the analog filter. Am I starting off with a filter? FA, right? And this is my discrete filter. At some chosen frequency f. So I want this response here and this response here to be equal, right? This is hs and this is hz. So I know this. I want this. I am telling the, 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 the design to do that for me. I know this. Because I choose this as my sampling frequency. So at this point, I have everything that I need to calculate this unknown constant here. Yeah? And of course, you could recall that, remember, if you like, capital omega is 2 pi f over fs. So you could simplify this down. If you want to remember this, remember this as c equal 2 pi tan 0 0.5 capital omega, and omega is 2 pi f over fs. Half of that will give me pi, pi f over fs, right? However you choose to re re um, remember it. So this is going to allow us to map some analog frequency to a desired frequency through the constant c. Following me so far, yeah? Make sense? All I've done is to, 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 to start with what we well, what the bilinear transform is and solve for that unknown, the matching constant here. Right? So notice this is a very, very nonlinear relationship because our analog frequency range can go anywhere from minus infinity to infinity. The discrete frequency range, omega, goes from minus pi to pi, or f goes from f s over two to minus f s over two. So we are taking an infinite band of analog frequencies that the bilinear is a it's a nonlinear relationship, and it's compressing an an an, an infinite um, continuous time frequency range into a finite discrete frequency range that is limited by a sampling frequency. And you can already tell it's nonlinear because of tan. Remember the tan function is like this, right? It's a highly nonlinear, oops, sorry, what am I doing? It's, it, it, it goes the other way home, right? Right, remember it, the tan function has asymptotes. Yeah? There are certain values where it approaches infinity. 
okay? So it's a highly nonlinear uh, function. But if once we remember that we are confined to minus plus or minus fs over two, then we understand we have the limits here. We're not going to, if we go beyond that, then we're in trouble, all right? Again, you're following me, make sense? Yes? And more importantly, are you hearing me? <laughs> this nonlinear relationship is called warping. And those of you who are into science fiction and, 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 and like science fiction shows and so on would have probably heard that term before. It's not, it's not traveling faster than light. In this case, it's just bending everything. It's like what Einstein spoke about, how space is warped. Well, here we have a, 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 an extreme side kind of warping here that you're taking an infinite um, analog frequency range and you are squeezing it into um, a known range of plus or minus fs over two. Right? So the design steps are like this. First off, as we said for all of the designs before, you choose an appropriate analog filter. So you go to some where some either your your online or your text or your own experience and so on, and you get a filter that is behaving how you want it to behave. Then you select a particular frequency in that analog filter's response, and we call that particular frequency FA, and we are going to design a digital filter to map FA to an, a frequency that we choose now in the, in the frequency domain. And the mapping is going to be through this particular relationship here. So we match that an omega, and of course, this is where we choose F in the um, digital or discrete filter, right? So we choose F, we know FA, and because we choose F, we also have to choose FS, right? That sampling frequency, we must choose that, and then we calculate C. And then once you do that now, you substitute 4S in the, 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 the analog filter, and you get an expression now in terms of Z. Okay, so let's see how that will work in, an, in a practical example. Here's the issue. So design a filter using this bilinear transform or transformation whose response at three kilohertz matches the response of an appropriate analog filter, HS, at omega A equal to four radians per second. So this is, and this design will be based on the analog filter shown be below, and you must have this, right? This is absolutely important. So this is HS, and I'm saying that for HS, I'm going to make HS at WA have the same response as HZ, look up for the magnitude here, right? the magnitude of HZ at three kilohertz, All right? So that is what, what, what the, the, this is saying. So HS at WA, at om w, omega A, HS at four radians per second is going to be equal to HZ at three kilohertz. And I know FS is 12 kilohertz. Right? And we're going to use the bilinear transform. So what we want is in this now, I have to substitute wherever S is equal to C, Z minus one over Z plus one. Right? So I'm substituting that in here, but I have to solve for C first. I don't know what C is. So the first step is to get C. And then afterwards we could do the, the, the rest is just algebra. But you understand what, 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 what we're saying here. So at this point, so this analog filter has some response and at four radians per second, 
this magnitude here b now we're going to map that we have a we want to design a digital filter and a three kilohertz and we want the response here to be b okay so i know this i know this i know this so we need to calculate s so that the two b's here are equal and then once I do that, I substitute inside of here and get HZ. Everybody following? That's the process. Make sense? Right. So FA is equal to C over 2 pi tan 0 0.5 capital omega. Right, omega is equal to 2 pi f over fs, right, which is, um, well, in this case, we know um, we can substitute what we have in, in, inside of here because we know f is 3 kilohertz, fs is 12 kilohertz. So if I substitute in there, put three over 12 pointing, I have omega 0 0.5 here. So solve for C. If I solve for C here, FA, remember, omega A is equal to two pi FA. Omega A is four, so that's two pi FA, so that FA is equal to, um, what do you call it? Four over two pi. All right, so FA is 4 over 2 pi. Inside of here is um, omega is 0.5 pi. So inside of here is tan 0.25 pi. So I can solve for C. As it turns out, C is equal to 4. So the expression now is to substitute 4 Z minus 1 over Z plus 1 into HS which you will give me for. So you do the substitution and you get that. You simplify, but of course, the final answer has to be in the form of, we want, once we get it in Zs, we want to convert it back into negative indices. Okay, and remember what they find, what, what the standard forms always are. It's a, um, a B0 plus B1Z minus 1 plus B2, that to the power minus 2 over 1 plus A1Z um, minus 1 plus A2Z minus 2, et cetera. So when you get this answer, when you get whatever this answer is here, you want to try to get it into that form, OK? So if you do that, you will eventually get the answer looking something like this. As I mentioned before, under if you're given this in the exam and you will be given this every I, um, you, you get one of these. If you do this, if you reach here and you stop, right? If everything was correct up to here and you stop, you have about 70% of the marks here, all right? If you convert this, to the negative indices and so on, and you leave it there, you have 90% of the mark. And then if you convert it into the standard form, which starts with a one down here, then that's where you get a full 100, okay? So let time be your guide. You already have, if, if you're really running short on time and you calculate everything else, when you get to, to this point, right? And you at least expand this, right? Don't leave it like this, expand this for me. Right, so you have an expanded polynomial here. So 3z squared plus 6z um, plus 3 over the 31z squared minus 26z plus z. If you leave it like that and, and time runs out or you have to go on to something else, leave it go. You have 70% of the marks, whatever the, the, the marks for that part um, will be, okay? You come back now and you have some time and you take, okay, and you, you look at this thing and you multiply it through, you see Z, here, Z, here, so you multiply this by Z, 
minus two over z minus two top and bottom. Okay, so at that state, if you, if you did that, you would have get you would have gotten three plus six z minus one plus three z minus two over thirty one minus twenty six z to the minus one plus z minus seven z minus two. You leave it at that and you go your way. You have ninety percent of the marks. And if you normalize by dividing everybody by thirty one now to get this answer, then you get the remaining marks, okay? But let, you know, you work, work wisely. Use your time, but once your time is finished, go and do something else unless you have extra time, okay? And of course, with all these designs, you must look and see, I did this, but I'm doing this for a reason, not, 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 for the, not because somebody gave you a problem to solve. You really have to check this. This would have been some practical design that you're trying to work around. So you plot the response. This is what that um, filter response looks like. It's a low-pass filter, okay? And the response is, is what you see in blue here. Notice again the green. This is a phase. And notice that it's not linear. All right, so it, 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 um, it, it has an issue. And, but that is because of the infinite response behavior. But let's compare the two of them. Look at the analog. This is HS on the left and HZ on the right. Remember what the bilinear transform is supposed to do. It picked four radians per second, and we're telling it to match the response of this at three kilohertz. Let's see that look. If you draw a line straight across, notice that the response here and there is the same as the magnitude of the response here. And notice that because the magnitude response matches at that particular um, at, at that particular frequency, that H Z, the response of H Z is more or less the same as the response of HS. It will not be identical because you are making some assumptions. Remember, the relationship between S and Z is a first order McLaurin expansion. There are a lot of other terms in there that we didn't, we, we, we ignored. But at least for the first order, the approximation is working. Yeah? So you're seeing that. And of course, let's check the impulse response just to see. Notice this one takes about 10 sample periods, right? Which is looking like at about 0.85 milliseconds, right? So 0.8 by 10 to the minus three seconds for this particular thing. Is that good or bad? That depends on the application. It's not an audio application because of the, 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 the poor phase response, but Whatever you put into this system will take, will be delayed by 0.8 milliseconds. For people in controls and so on, this is, you have um, this coming through, this will be part of your control systems. So you come in and you, it's picking up some information outside. It's doing the filtering in order to, to get data, to, to extract the data that you want to use in the control system but it imposes a delay of, in this case, about 0 0.8, 0 0.85 um, milliseconds. Can the control system handle that? All right, you all, uh, when you did controls, you made analog control systems, you know you have um, you, you, the delays in, 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 um, in systems that you have to compensate for, right? Dead time and, 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 and lags and all that kind of thing. The same thing in the in the discrete domain here, right? Can it handle 0 0.8, 0 0.8 to 0 0.85 uh, milliseconds? That will have to do with the system itself. If if it's a robot moving very heavy components from point A to point B, how far would the the, the system travel in 0.85 milliseconds before it got the 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 um the proper response? Would it move too far? Would it now constitute, would it overshoot where it was supposed to go? Would it now go into a zone where it becomes dangerous to, to, to humans alongside it? Or if this is a, 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 a car, 
right? And this is part of the control system for the throttle for the car. When you when you mash the accelerator now, is the 0.8 milliseconds too long? Or if you step on the brakes or some emergency stop, is 0.8 um, uh, milliseconds too long? Okay, that is what determines if the IIR response, the infinite, the quote unquote infinite response is adequate or not. All right. And of course, in terms of processing, this was what the transfer function. So this would have been the B's here and the A's here. Okay. And you um you fill in the, 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 the sort of data flow here. So the input comes in and it processes it according to whatever is in, in those um, boxes. Each of these represents a delay. It's a second order system, so there'll be at least two delays, meaning it has to store at least two intermediate values before it goes ahead. All right? So questions? Make sense? Remember the essence, the whole, rationale behind this particular um the whole rationale behind this particular approach the bilinear transform approach is this that you take you take a known response right so you take a known response at at some frequency take a known response at some frequency sorry you take a known trans uh, a known filter you pick a, 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 um, a, a point in that frequency response for that filter, and you match the amplitude of that response to the frequency that you want in the discrete domain. And if it works, if the matching works, then because of the, map, the, the bilinear mapping or the bilinear transform, you're going to create a transfer function that will mimic in the discrete domain what the analog um, transfer function was doing in the analog domain or in the S-plane, right? So any questions? I'm sure you will have as, uh, as you go over it, but, but um, anything right now at this point in time that, that, that strikes out at you? Okay. All right, so... I'll stop it here, right? Um, the lecture, the, there's a, a, another example um, set of slides after this that I'm going to, that, that are up already. So those are the ones that you have to do, do some homework now. So, so the ones from mon Monday and today are in the next set, and the ones from last week on the FIR filters as well. So those are the ones that you have to try and see if you get the answers that I've put up um, in my slides. It also includes um, two MATLAB functions because you can do both the in, in pulse invariant and the bilinear transforms. There are commands in MATLAB to do it. So you can use that to check, to, to check the answers. There are some differences because MATLAB automatically normalizes the response. It does a check and, and, and tries to match the responses identically at DC as I mentioned before. So sometimes you get a, a, a slightly different answer when you work it out by hand, and that's simply because MATLAB are done, has done the adjustments for you. Okay? So try those two. You have the, that homework to do. And all, uh, uh, some of you all are in the middle of the, um, the, the um, what do you call it, the 3020, um, there's the last week you now to, to sort of finalize everything and so on. But take the time, do the examples and so on. Next week, Monday, when we meet, we're going to do the, the, the summer look, look at some DSP examples and we'll actually finish it off on Wednesday. I'll wait first off to, to get some feedback from everybody to see because Wednesday is the day when everybody's, um, whoever is doing 3020, the, the project is due. So I know um, class attendance may be very, very poor. So let's see how it goes on Monday and I'll decide exactly what we do for next week, Wednesday's class. All right. Tutorial problem set three is up already for you to try. And what we'll probably do is to wait until um, we finish everything and then we'll go through all the problem sets and, and, and try things and, and see what works. Um, because it's only when you start to go over the thing and try problems that you will see where you need some clarifications and or additional explanations, yeah? All right?
So if nothing else at this point in time, this is it for today. You have an early day. And again, those of you who are doing the, the, the project, use the time wisely. Sort of made the adjustments for you. So um, make use of it. Okay, so I will see you all next week, Monday morning, um, God willing. Take care.